Welcome, everyone. So it's another Facebook Live. This is Karen Charles, and I've got some fun ideas to share with you of what we're doing. And while everybody's starting to join, just let me remind you not to click any links or, um, you know, if something doesn't seem right, then don't obviously open a link that somebody's posted. And uh, we've got some things that I'm going to be talking about today, and you can find the product numbers listed up above. And Amy is here. She is going to be leading this and helping me to um, understand what questions are out there. So make sure if you've got a question to please let me know so that I can answer it. And if not, I'll go back afterwards and, and try and catch up on some of the questions that might not have gotten answered. So today we're talking about some creative ways of making our cook borders and our garments look a little bit more interesting. Now, this is something that I think... I, sounds strange. I think I'm a very in the box kind of person, but I'm always struggling to get out of the box. And so every time I see a square, I feel like it needs to be a curve. And every time I see something that's not symmetrical, I feel, uh, or that is symmetrical, I, I fight against it and I try and make things that are not symmetrical. So oops, sorry about that. Hold a second here. Make sure usually this is off. And one of the examples is I just did this little table runner. We did this as an event last year. And we used piping to make our curve lines right here. And you can see what the piping looks like. And that's one way of getting curves. I'm going to show you how you can do that. And if I just change to this camera, here's another example of the same type of thing. Look at the definition that happens between that printed black and white print and the red fabric, you'll see that black line. That is just a different way of, se of separating out the fabric. And I'm going to show you how that was done. But I also have um, things that are for garments or for quilt borders. Now, here is an example of a quilt border that I've made. It's actually quite long. It's enough for quite a large size quilt. And I did that in embroidery by combining two different fabrics. And I'm going to show you the trick that makes this happen. But before we do that, I'm going to show you how we can do this kind of thing in sewing. Because every time I do a Facebook Live, I try and show you some ways you can do it in sewing and then how you can do things in embroidery. I have one more piece here. And this is a garment that I'm making. And this is just a finished piece. Right now, I've kind of made the pattern, but I haven't uh, cut out the, pa the pattern piece yet. So all I've done is join the two pieces together and done the embroidery, but I haven't, um, I haven't actually cut out the pattern piece. That will be what I'll do next. But this was done in embroidery. And before we get to doing that though, I want to talk about some techniques you can use. Maybe you only have a sewing machine and you would like to do a, a technique like this. Now we have the simplest of all simple ideas. All right. Here is a shape where you can get a curve. And the way this was done was I have lots of curve rulers. And if you don't have a curve ruler, what you can do is take a piece of cardboard and then cut out the shape that you find is appealing. And you can use that the same way. But I love to have a few different shapes of, of rulers like this. This one's got more of an open curve and then a smaller, more in-depth curve. But there's all kinds of different rulers out there. And there's no specific ruler. There's not a right or a wrong ruler. But here's an example of how I just took that line and I drew it. Now, once I've drawn that line, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put another fabric behind it. And in this case, I have this pink fabric behind it. And I'm just going to sew on the straight line that I've drawn. And after I've sewn on that line, what I want to do is cut away the extra fabric that brings me up to that curve. Now, it is always easier when you're doing this to not just lay the fabric one on top of the other because what will happen is they're, uh, they're going to move. So you need to stabilize them in some way. In this case, you can see that I have back here about two and a half inches underneath there. So I could do a basting stitch on either side to stop it to move. Or I could use something like Roxanne's basic glue. This would work really well also. But what you really wanna do is to stop the fabrics from shifting underneath. So as a very, very simple way of doing this in sewing, I could sew on that line, 
cut the fabric to come away from it and then add a satin stitch. And you know, I love our beautiful Who's Friend of Biking satin stitch. And just finish that raw edge off with a satin stitch. Afterwards, the fabric that's underneath, that extra fabric, you would go in and cut it away. And so that's how one way of, of doing it as a very simple sewing way of getting a curve to um, a quilt pattern or a border. Now, if I was going to take it a step a little more involved, and I personally think it's easier because if you've ever sewn a satin stitch, you know sometimes that it's really kind of challenging to get that satin stitch to look perfectly even. Usually what I'll do is I'll go over it once and it captures in all the raw edges. And then I might widen the, the, the width of the satin stitch just a one more notch and then go over it a second time. And that way I know I've caught everything and it's gonna look like a fuller satin stitch. Now, in this case, this is much more simple than having a satin stitch because what I've done is I've sewn a piece of piping to the same curve line. And after I've sewn the piping to the curve line, I'm going to cut the extra fabric over here. The cord is to the over to here, and I'm going to cut this fabric away. And then after I've got that done, there's my piece. I take the piping and I turn it to the back. And now when I lay it on top of that other fabric, all I have to do is use that same piping foot and stitch in the ditch. So I've set my machine up so you can see that. I'll go over and, and kind of just give you an idea of how it's done. But obviously the biggest challenge is the top fabric wants to move from the bottom. And this is where you can really make your life easier if you just base the fabrics along the edge or use a little bit of that Roxanne's basic glue to hold it in place. Now I'm using a regular piping foot for this, but you can see with the piping, you're getting a really rich solid edge and you don't have to worry so much about the quality of your stitching. Now, when we do this, normally I would match the piping color of thread to my piping. And I really do want it to be in the ditch. And so let me just switch over here and I'm gonna go and change my screen and I'm going to go to sewing and here I have my straight stitch and I have my piping foot that is on my machine and what I'm going to just change over here and just zoom in a little bit so you can see better hold on one more click all right so the needle is going to come between my fabric and the piping and all I'm going to do is have my needle in the center position, just a straight stitch. And it's letting me know that I'm not using my IDF, which is normal because I don't have that on my piping foot. And I'll just do a little bit so you can kind of see how that works. Now, remember, I'm using lime green thread so that I want you to see it. And I think it's kind of fascinating because when you look at it up close, even though there's stitching there, if I open up the piping, let me just pull this back a little bit. You can see right in the ditch is the lime green thread, but it really is invisible. Even using a completely different thread color, it's totally not obvious that you've top stitched that like that. And it really did a really nice job. So that was using the regular piping foot. Let's see if there's any questions. So that's one technique in sewing. There's lots of different ways of getting curves. If I really wanted to, uh, let's see if I pull this one back up here. If I really wanted to add a little bit of pizzazz afterwards, I could applique some leaves to the outside edge. I could add other stems. I could do all kinds of different things. When we go into embroidery, it gets a little bit more exciting, obviously, because not only do we have uh, one shape or multiple different like curves, we can do a lot of different things. So this was a design that I pulled off the MySonet library and I chose the fabric. This is like a, a linen cotton blend. And the believe it or not, the front of the fabric is the same as the back. It's one, they're both good size. So on one side, it's a light blue and on the other side, it's a dark blue, but they're both meant to be right sides of the fabric. So all I did for this was I used the exact same fabric. I just flipped one side of it around to change the color. 
And in my software, let me go and pull up a design that I was using for this. This was the design that I was working with. And I wanted to check it out and see how it was going to stitch out. So what I did was in my software, I went to the design player and I usually will do this. And I just went from the back to the very beginning of the design and I checked it out. Now notice this green stitching line that's here first. That was not part of the design. That was part I made to tack down the fabric. And I'll show you that in a little bit because I'm going to show you another way of doing it too. So that's the way that design stitches out. So what I'm looking for is originally a design that in the middle gives me an opportunity. You see this nice curved line? This is almost the same type of line as I got with the ruler. So that's what I'm looking for when I'm evaluating whether an embroidery design will work well. In this case, this was a real simple curve shape. So I actually did this through um, design shaping in my, um, my designer Epic too. So I see we've got a couple of questions here. So let me come back. So how to sew the piping on the top material? Oh, you know what? I just realized too, I had a couple of other things since I moved on with that. So when I'm sewing the piping on, yes, that piping will be the fabric that's on top. But another good thing to make uh, note of is you should always have the darker fabric on top. Because if I had the yellow fabric on top, I'm going to see the darker color shading underneath. And I don't want that, right? In this case, when I did this one here, you'll notice that I had the yellow fabric underneath. And I put the purple color on top. And that's because the purple is darker. It would have shown through underneath here if there were any seam allowance showing. So that's why I always put the darker color on top. And I'm sewing the piping on to the fabric that will be on top. So in this case, there is the exact same piece of fabric. I sewed the piping on to the purple. And then I cut the fabric away. And then that's where I'm top stitching like that. I hope that makes sense and ask me another question if that didn't um if that I didn't explain that well enough. So thanks for checking on that though. That was great. So and is let's see, is there oh and somebody said I have a Topaz 50. Can I do that piping as well? All of our machines can do piping. Every single machine that's a who's front of Viking machine going back 30 years can make piping. And that's a simple, easy technique that really adds a lot of extra oomph to your, you know, whether it's a garment you're sewing, look at how that blue shows out. Don't you love how like, it's just like nice and solid and it gives it a really nice edge to it. This can be something that you can use to make it as a hem. And I'm going to show you a few other different projects. You can use it for pillowcases, but piping by itself is very, very easy to do, and it adds a lot of drama to it. Now, if you were going to use this piping to make a pillowcase for it, maybe you like the idea of making a fancy pillowcase, you might not want the cord inside the piping, and you can see it right there. And all I have to do is open up that edge. There's the exposed piping, and I can pull the piping out. As long as I haven't sewn it, it will come out, and so I can take it out if I don't want... Uh, piping to be, you know, like in a pillowcase where you might be sleeping on that edge. And then the, all that does is it gives you a nice little flange too. So that's a, another good thing to think about. Now, when it comes to a design like this, I'm using much, much wider fabrics. And so that changes it up too. One of the things that you're thinking about if you're going to embroider is what hoop are you going to use? So if you're using something that's narrow, like something like a quilt border, then the endless hoop works really well. The mega endless hoop is a perfect hoop to use for that because it's a continuous design. But let's go back to that original design that I was talking about, this one right here. So I sent that to my Epic 2, and I did not have that lime green design that was underneath it. I'm going to go over there to my machine. And let's get back in focus so that you can see what we're going to be doing in, in our embroidery machine. All right. So I'm just going to zoom out a little bit. Now, right now, there is that same design. 
And all it is, is you'll see all of the stitching you see is the main part of the design. But I wanted to get a design that would tack that two different fabrics together. And so what I did was I created a line of stitching by going into design shaping. Now, design shaping, you'll find on many of our machines, the Sapphire 85, the uh, designer Diamond Royale, the Epics and the Ruby 90 and the Epic 2, they all have design shaping. And what I'm gonna do is go down to the bottom where this little star in the circle is. And I'm going to choose a shape. And the shape I'm gonna choose is a wave shape. So if I look at this design right now, and actually I think I'm gonna come out and I'm gonna just mirror image this design. Let's mirror image it the other way. All right, now when I come back in, I deselected it and I'm gonna choose the same wave. And I'm gonna rotate that wave so it's going in the same direction. So you can kind of see that there's a real similarity to the size of that. Now, right now there's no stitches. All I'm doing is creating the shape. And I'm looking for a shape that's exactly the same as that center line. If I wanna make that line a little bit thinner, then what I'm gonna do is go to scale and I'm gonna unlock the little padlock and now I can drag it in and make that line a little thinner. So what do you think? It's getting pretty close to that shape of that line, isn't it? I mean, it's almost perfect. And I can just adjust it a little bit more. And if I need to rotate it, I can also rotate it too. So right now, all I have is that line. And to add stitches to that line, I'm going to go up to my zigzag, which is my sewing stitches. And I'm going to use a triple stitch because the triple stitch is going to be reinforced and it'll give me a much stronger seam so that when I cut away the extra fabric, it won't ravel on me. And so right now I have, oh, I didn't even load it. Let me load it. I get too busy talking. All right, so I have one stitch down here on the bottom left. And if I touch where it says one, I'm just gonna add 70 stitches. And that's just a guess, but look at that. It filled pretty much that whole area. And now when I touch okay, I have an extra line of stitching that's gonna fit in exactly where I need it to be. And if I probably might need to rotate the line, oh, look at that, that's just about perfect. So move it over here a little bit. So now I have a line of stitching that goes underneath the first one that I did. The only thing I need to do is change the stitch out order so that that line will stitch first. So I'm gonna come back into my layers over here and I'm gonna change the stitch out order. So now the line will stitch first and that design will stitch out second. Isn't that pretty cool? And so as we're going to see how that stitches out, the important thing to understand, and let me pull that back up for you, is when I started with this design, it is wider. My fabric was wider than the um, endless hoop. So I needed to use a, my 360 by 200 hoop for that because I, I needed to hoop it. And so what I ended up doing was I had two pieces of fabric. I had the blue one and then I had the navy one. And underneath the blue, I had the blue fabric coming and it came all the way over to here. So underneath here, there was a layer of fabric and I basted it with a, a basting stitch in my sewing machine. And I also basted the edge of the blue fabric over here. And so all of those fabrics acted as one. Then the next thing I did was I sewed that line of stitching that I just brought in. And after I sewed that line of stitching, then I cut the extra fabric that was on top and to give me that curved line. And then I just did the rec rest of the decorative stitch. Then I rehooped and kind of kept going with that. And you can kind of see, it's actually, once you've done it the first time, it's really easy to keep going with that. And uh, I deliberately made this a little bit more tone on tone. So it was a little bit more sedate, not usually my style, but I think it really can have a, a lot of effect. Now, 
let me just change over this camera here. And in this case, this design itself, it had that line already built in. And I'll show you on the computer what that looked like because that did make it a lot easier. I didn't have to do anything except use that design. So let me, I'll pull up this design. Okay. So that was the design that I was working with right here. And if I went to the design player, and this is my typical thing that I do, I'll go to the design player and I want to see how that design is built. And much just to my surprise, I'll make that window a little bigger for you to see. Much to my surprise is when I started to look at it, the very first thing it did was bring me this outline. And then it started doing the green leaves. And then it did the satin stitch. So what I wanted to do was I wanted to copy that straight design right at the very beginning and separate it out so that my machine would stop before it went any farther, okay? And so just to show you how I did it, because I have the ability to cut designs apart, I think that is one of the most important things to have, and that's why I love the software so much. What I did was I went to modify, and I used the same type of scroll bar up here and dragged it back and just... I'm not taking it away. They're not disappearing. They're, I'm just hiding them until I get to the point where all I'm seeing is that line. All right. So I have just that green line left. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just draw a shape around it. I could have just chosen get a box. All right. And now I'm going to touch copy. I don't really want to delete the original line. I want an extra line. So I touch copy. And now when I come back to my home page, I'm going to touch paste. And so it's a separate line that's by itself. Now, all I have to do is change the color so it doesn't color sort when I go in and um, join the whole design together. Let's make it blue so you'll be able to see it well. All right. And I'm going to move it back to the original placement for it. And I'll zoom in so you can see exactly where that's going. All right. So there you can see the blue line. It's got kind of going over the flowers. And I can get it placed just perfect. So the next thing I'm going to do is combine the design. All right. I combine it. And then you'll notice over here, the very last color is the blue. Well, I want that color to be first. So I'm going to go to modify and select that color and just move it up. And so now that color is going to stitch out as my first color. And that's why it's hidden when I come back to the screen. So when I went to stitch this out, it was really important because the fabric was wide. I needed to make sure that I really basted these layers of fabrics together. And I'll show you here on the one that I have. This was the end of it. This is the part that I haven't finished yet, but I left it undone. So what you can see, I'll pull it up here like this. Here I have one piece of fabric and then the other piece of fabric goes right on top of it. And you can see that I could keep going. I could have added another block up here if I wanted to. Where it is challenging sometimes, and I know Glenda, you can see this is looking crooked here right now, right? It's very easy for the fabric to start moving on you. That's why you want to baste right here along this edge. And then where the other one is over here, you want to turn it over and baste it there too. So these two edges are basted and you never have to worry about them moving. Uh, Glenda, somebody had seen this as a technique that I'd done before and I know she's probably watching today. And she did this but she had a little bit of a challenge with some puckering. And that's because that these fabrics were not basted together. So they moved as you were going. That's a great question. We have a question about stabilizers. So when I'm doing something like this for this quilt one, I used a tearaway stabilizer and I was able to use the endless hoop, the mega endless hoop. And I'll pull that up in a second so you can see I have it just down on the side. 
And uh, it was really easy to do and very fast to do because the design fit into the endless hoop. And I lined this purple fabric up with the edge of that endless hoop and it kept me straight as I was going. And I thought in the beginning when I did the first one, I've actually done four of these. When I did the first one, I thought that I, I probably didn't need to base because I was using the endless hoop, it would keep me straight. But it's amazing how our eyes can fool us. And really the only way of making sure that that fabric stays continuously even is to give those two pieces of fabric a base, uh, is, uh, is to um, base them before you start. When I was doing something like this for the quilt, using the tearaway made a lot of sense. First of all, tearaway is cheaper. And honestly, you can see on the back, it tore completely away. There's no obvious tearaway anywhere here at all. But when I came to working with my jacket, it was a little bit different uh, because this fabric was a little bit slipperier and I was worried about it moving more. So I chose to use a um, stick on tearaway because I thought it would hold the fabric in place, did a really nice job of doing that. And most of it tore away, but there was some that's left in there that hasn't torn away at all. And so usually when I'm working with a garment, I much prefer, especially if a garment like a jacket where you might see both sides, right? If I this, if you wanted to see inside, you don't want to see tear away. So I, it's the one time where I usually will use the Aqua Magic Plus, which is a sticky. It will have your fabric will stick to it, but then when you're done, the stabilizer goes right away, and it helps the fabric to relax too. You don't want to be able to see this on the inside of your garment. Now, eventually, this is going to wash away. Um, but it's still, a, I, I use this, um, tear away because I thought it would be easier for you to be able to see the stabilizer where it was staying. You could almost see how nice that would be if it was an applique design, right? So when you're thinking about your stabilizer, it depends upon what you're using. If it's a garment and you want the inside and outside to both look nice, the Aquamagic Plus is a perfect choice for that. The regular Aquamagic is all right, but it's not really strong enough because the fabric tends to shift more. So in this is the one case where I really would recommend the Plus because it is fusible. And I'm not fusible, but sticky. And so it's going to hold your fabric and stop it from shifting as you're going. Let's see, we've got 327 here. We've still got plenty of time to do this. Is there any other questions that anybody has? Now let's look at a few other designs while we're waiting to see if there's any other questions. And I want you to look at when I'm choosing a design, what type of design would work really well from this? So if I go to my Sonet library, all right, let me just log in here. I'm gonna put in my Sonet library. And I'm going to choose, let me see here. I'm going to choose a design. Now, I if I put in endless, that's a really good option because I know that uh, an endless design is probably going to have the kind of curve that I'm looking for and the continuous. I can even get in endless with corners, but I'm not going to do that. And so you can see the very first design was the one that I used for the garment I'm making. But there are a lot of other designs in here that might be really appropriate. And sometimes you just got to scroll through them to find something you're looking for. It came up with the MySonet library, came up with 1146 designs. Now, actually, this could be really fun. Look at that ducky. Wouldn't that be really cute on a little girl's jacket, a little boy's pair of pants, something like that? So I'm going to just bring the design in. And I'm going to evaluate it for whether it would work for what I wanted it to do. And that design is going to just show up here. And this is an endless design. So it means it's got the endless markers in it. And if I look at it in the design player, I can see that the ducks are first. And then we have this little black line. Watch it. It's coming now. Look at that. It gives us that little wave and then it adds the satin stitch out to it. So that would work really perfect for doing a design like we're talking about. Because as long as we have that opportunity to separate something out, to be able to lay the fabric down, that's all it's gonna take. So just to show you, like I just randomly chose this design and I'm gonna go 
into modify. I'm going to scroll to the part, get rid of the duckies. All right. And get rid of the satin stitch. All I want left is that just straight little black line. All right. Where is that straight little black line? It's in there somewhere. All right. Hold on a second here. Let me get my mouse. So I can also touch, and you'll see it's adding in the lines. I can touch the minus and it'll add them in. But this scroll bar adds them in a little bit quicker. Wait a second. I need to move back this way. All right. So if I look at that and I zoom in on it closely, I can see what it's going to look like. So you can see there's the satin stitch. And just by going back a little bit the other way, I can see the design the way that it's going to stitch out. Let me just see if I could get that out there. So what I'm looking for is just to have that straight line that's there. So I would click stitch by stitch and find that area. And I won't take any more time to do it. But imagine how cute that design could be. So there's a lot of designs like that that would give you a very obvious straight line for you to be working with. Okay, so let's come back to the idea of what size shape that we have here. This could be waves. It could be a garment. It could be just about anything. When you're thinking about how the, how the design is going to work for you, sometimes you want to think about how you would use the design. There was another design... And the one, the collection that this came from, this is called Madeira. And so it is, they're all endless designs, but it's called Madeira. So if you were to go back and you would look up in the Mysonet Library Madeira, it would bring you, I think there's like 13 or 14 different designs that would all work like this. Another one that worked like that, and I'll show you right here. I thought this could be a really fun design because when I look at it, I'm thinking that that bottom part is grass. So as I scroll back, look at, do you see that nice firm line that's there? So that one is going to be really easy to cut that line and copy it. And imagine if I was making a garment for this and the green, I would have green fabric underneath. And then in the skirt, I could have a print, uh, I could have a, you know, blue fabric or any other color I wanted to because it's an endless design and it's a large one, it would really stitch out pretty quickly. And the only thing that would really matter for me is just choosing my fabric, really. That's what it's all about. So every time you look at a design, if you cannot find an obvious place where the stitches already exist, then you can make your stitches yourself. You can bring um, the stitches into digitizing and create your own curved lines, or you can go into modify and cut part of the design apart like that, but it isn't harder. Everything is easier when it comes to that type of a design. Even in design shaping, the way that I added that curve line and it, the shaping of it, that could be anything. Instead, I could have it going and curve this way here, and I can combine different types of lines to make that happen. So if you're looking at, let's go back and look at this here, all right? And you can see, you don't see any raw edges anywhere. The satin stitch completely covered up the raw edge. And because it's covered in with the leaves and the flowers, that did a really great job of um, covering it up and keeping that fabric strong so that you don't have to worry about it falling apart. And as it was a quilt, I'm going to pull this over here. If this was a quilt, you would want to, the next thing you'd want to think about is if you're going to use this for a quilt border, how are you going to miter the corners so that this will fit together for a quilt? Okay. So if this was one side and now I have the other one over here, I'll pull it up. I'm making this look awkward. Sorry about that. All right. So here is my quilt top, right? And if I wanted to miter this so that it would be the same, I'd have to think about what it would look like. So the quilt border has a little bit extra things to think about that you don't have to think about if you are, let me see. Oh, I got the wrong side over here. Sorry about this. I see everything backwards. Okay. So how would you miter this corner so that you would get that 45 degree angle, right? And make it look right. Now, this is not right. You've got to have the white part up here. So what I usually do is on my wall back over here, 
I take it and I pinned it to see what it would look like. All right. And then I could see, obviously, I'm doing a terrible job. Let me go and pin it, okay? Because then I think it's going to make more sense to you. So if I take this, all right, let's say this is my border. And I'm going to pin it in place. Might need to get myself a couple more pins. All right, all right, a second. And I brought this quilt up. Now, do you think this would look nicer with the purple next to this or the yellow? I think the purple is going to be nicer. And so that's kind of what I'm going to be doing here is evaluating what I like. And so by bringing this over and pinning it into place, then I'm going to have a better idea what it's going to look like. All right. And let me get another pin. Might have to take this one out of here. Okay. So right now I have that coming straight down have to steal a couple more pins and I'm going to take the next piece this kind of looks kind of fascinating doesn't it I think that could be really nice let me see if I can find some more pins okay now if this was going over here I had this purple border and this was coming here, how would I line it up? Would I line it up like this? Oh, I see what I could do. Hold on. I think I see what I could do. Let me just get that out of the way there. So this is gonna come back like this at a 45 degree angle. This is going to come over here. Now, I'd have to move it down, but look at how nice this would be if it came over here. So basically, this part right here would have to come down, and I can make that happen really quickly. Okay? So that's what you got to figure out before you go too far when you're doing something like this. How are you going to make it work? Okay? So let me just tuck that behind. So as you're figuring this out, I can see that this is coming here. Next time I'm going to plan this out a lot better because it would be really kind of cool. So look at that shape that you're getting happening here. Right there, like that. Now, you don't know what this is going to look like until you start figuring it out and laying it out. So there's a really very, very small place where you've got to stop. So see how I continued on here? I wouldn't want to have anything beyond that point. So it's always kind of weird when you're figuring it out how you're going to lay it out. So the first two points, when you get one piece and another, then you got to figure out how they're going to go together. Because you can see there's a right way and a wrong way. If you don't know, the only way of doing this is usually what I do is just lay them out and I will get that folded back at a 45 degree angle and I'll check to see what would be the way that they would intersect. But what, isn't that a beautiful border that you could put on a quilt or a garment or anything else you're making, right? A pillowcase, it would be just beautiful. It just adds so much dimension to it and it's so different. Let's see. So um, one of the questions is, at what point are you cutting away the top fabric from the curve? What you're doing is, when you have the first part of the design, and let me go back to, uh, let me see. All right, let me come back to here. So when you're stitching this out, the very first design that we're going to do, all right, is going to be that outline. So I'm going to go back to the very first color. So this is going to be the very first design that I have to work with. So it's going to stitch both layers of the fabric together. And right when this is finished, this is when you're going to cut the fabric away from the curve. Because if you wait any longer, then, then you're going to have the satin stitch that's going to come over, right? Now look at, there's another triple stitch. 
And now you've got the satin stitch and it's a regular satin stitch. It kind of looks like grass, which is kind of cool. So if you can't wait till this point, you have to cut that away when all you have is that outline that's there, because that's when you're going to get an opportunity to get the raw edge in there and it will be a lot easier to get close to that fabric. And then the satin stitch is next. And then you've got the rest of the design just stitches out like normal. So I'll pull one of them down and I'll show you what I'm talking about when you're up close. Okay. So here you can see the design that's done and the purple was on top and the yellow, I cut it away. Now, when I was working on this, all right, the yellow was coming out here. And when it did the first outline around it, then I cut away the extra yellow fabric. But underneath that fabric, that yellow was, and the purple was still down there. So afterwards, I'm going to go back in and I'm going to trim it away. So you can trim the extra fabric from the back and also from the front. And you'll see that also, let me show you kind of with, with this type of thing, right? Here is an example of kind of what it looks like. The very first thing it's doing is it's anchoring the two fabrics together. Then you cut away the purple fabric from here. And underneath, you're going to have an extra layer of the yellow fabric to cut away. That's just giving you more fabric to work with. So the fabric's not going to waste, but that's kind of what's happening. Then with the embroidery design, after you get that anchored, then it's going to do the rest of the design. And then with an endless design, you're just going to continue going and keep on rehooping and rehooping and going all the way. Now, here's my endless design, my endless hoop. So when I was working with the endless hoop, it was just a matter of instead of having all those different layers, I could open it up and I could bring my fabric in. Now, the purple fabric was over here like this. All right. And I lined it all up. And I had my stabilizer in it, obviously, right? You can see it's a little bit. Boy, I'm not giving the best demonstration today, but I hope you're excited about the idea. Hold on one second and I'll let I'll get it in here so you can kind of see. And then I'll lock it into place. Now, what I love about the endless hoop is. It's got this edge here that keeps it nice and straight. And so when you're doing the, the embroidery, after you get it in there, okay, this is the design. You can see how I can flatten the fabric out. And it will do this design right here. And then I could rehoop it and keep going with it. The very first part that's going to happen, all right, the purple fabric was coming all the way over to here on the top. Pretend this fabric, purple fabric, well, let's do it this way. The purple fabric was here. So the first stitch that happened was it went and did the, the shape there. And then I cut the purple fabric away right up close to where the satin stitch is. And then I completed the rest of the design. And then at that point, all you're doing is opening up your hoop, pulling your fabric through and doing the next one. I hope that makes sense. Let's see if there's any questions here. When you embroider for quilts on, on stabilizer, do you wash them? Oh, do you wash the fabrics? That's the perennial question, isn't it, about washing fabrics? I personally do not like to wash fabrics. When I'm quilting, when I'm doing anything, I prefer not to wash them. And the reason why is they have so much sizing in there that it makes them easier to work with. And it also kind of keeps it relatively straight on the grain. When you go and you wash them, they tend to get twisted. There's a lot more ironing that's involved and you've got to try and get them back into shape. The way I look at it is if I'm going to use this and I am going to iron it, I might use some best press or, you know, some kind of a starch or something like that. As I'm working with it, each time I'm ironing it, it probably is shrinking the tiniest little bit. But for me, that doesn't matter because it's so much easier to work with this fabric. And then after you put it all together and you've got the whole quilt together, then you're going to be quilting all the layers together. 
And if you haven't watched any of them, they're all going to shrink about the same thing. If anything, all it does, it gives a little bit of poof to the quilt, which makes it look a little bit more charming anyway. So I don't see any negative. I think a lot of the reasons that people do that are from years and years ago when they were hand quilting and how one fabric could quilt, could um, shrink more than another. I think today on the whole, most fabrics are pretty good and you don't really have to worry about them doing a lot of shrinking. Now, if you were working with flannel, that would be a whole different ball game, right? Flannel is really important that you shrink it because some of those flannels will shrink a lot. Some of them will shrink a little bit. I just bought a whole bunch of new flannels that I love, but I know that they will have to be washed ahead of time. So uh, let's see. And somebody asked about how many quilts that I've made. I have made um, probably about, I'll, I don't know, 50 to 75 quilts. I don't make as many large quilts. I've, I've only made a few large quilts. I tend to like to make wall hangings. And part of the reason is when I'm making quilts, I like to learn a technique and then I need to move on and learn another technique. So for me, it's really valuable to, the learning part of it is the most important thing. And I don't uh, make as many bed quilts as uh, maybe some other people do, but I love it. It's, um, well, that's true. Diane said, the washing isn't so much about shrinking as it is about bleeding colors, but I have not had a lot of problems with bleeding colors, Diane. So I know if you're using red or some of these other strong colors, it's good to do a color fast test. You can certainly wet it and see if any of the color, like if you had a red fabric and you put a piece of batting or fabric underneath and you wet it or put a little bit of soap on it and that color bleeds through, obviously that would be a really important thing to wash that fabric. But I, uh, that's the only reason I would ever wash it is for color fastness. And uh, most of, I've been very rare. I'll use a lot of extreme colors and it's very rare that I've had a problem with color fast, um, you know, with color bleeding and things like that. But it's um, but, you know, it's a personal choice. Nobody said that we all have to do the same thing. If you have a reason to do things differently or if that's a concern to you, then by all means, go ahead and wash the fabric. To me, it's just a lot of extra work that sometimes I don't have the time for. Now, there was a question about the curve ruler. This is not um, a fancy curve ruler. There are dozens of brands. I can tell you this brand is called Leaves Galore because a lot of them, these shapes, you can make different size leaves out of them. So the way that I've made this vein, then you could come in and you could make some applique leaves and go in there. And it's kind of what originally gave me the idea for doing this. But there are dozens and dozens of different rulers. Some of them, most of them will have two different shapes of curves, one that's more gentle and one that's a little bit more aggressive. But they're easy to find. You can get them at quilt stores and craft stores all over the place. So don't worry about that at all. So my uh, question, my what is my favorite sta uh, stabilizer when using to embroider quilts? Almost always, I'm going to use a tearaway. I don't need to use anything really um, beyond that because a tearaway, I use the regular tearaway though. It's got nice firmness to it. And look at how gorgeous that is. I didn't do any extra pressing. On the back, the stabilizer comes completely away. But what I like about that is in the flowers themselves, that tearaway is going to stay in there and it gives it a little extra body. And I think that really does encourage uh, a little bit nicer um, pressing and it gives it holds up well when you're using it. And uh, the tearaway is mostly what I, I use. There's no need to use something that's going to stay in there. As a matter of fact, like if you're using no shell mesh or some of those, they're more prone to shrinking than the fabric is. So if you're ever using no shell mesh, do not put um, you know, like a no shell mesh in there because your, your fabric is going to start crinkling up. And because it's a no shell mesh, it's a, it's a cutaway. It's going to stay in there and it's going to cause your quilt fabric to kind of like pull in. And then you're going to have to cut it all away. Um, because that's the only way that you have of getting it out of there. So, so somebody said, after you make your quilt, you have to teach us how to make a larger one. <laughs> <laughs> well, do you know the funny thing is with this, all right? I have four different panels that are all done. One of them's up on the wall, but doesn't that look cool? I love to see that irregular shape to it. And there's a lot of designs that are meant that have a lot of curls that might be uh, vines or leaves or flowers that really fit into a quilt that we're doing. 
So I've made the four panels and I only can find two of them. So now I have to go on a search through my sewing room so I can find the rest of my panels to be able to cut them away. Every time I put two different fabrics together, then I can um, I can really kind of think about, well, the, do I like this? And what quilt am I going to put this with? So this was the rare, rare time where I built the quilt borders before I built the quilt. I have no idea what quilt I want to put these borders on. I just think that the panel is so much fun. The designs are so nice. Now I have to find a quilt that I'm going to put it with. So the moment I get the quilt done with it, I will definitely show you what is um, what it's going to look like. So let's see. We have another couple of questions here. And uh, Diane said that show color guard sheets work really well for getting the extra dye out, which is a really great idea. And uh, things like that, you know, like, isn't it nice to be able to share together? Imagine we are so lucky that we have a craft that we all love to share what we do. And it's exciting to think about what we can do with it. So on a short scale, what I want you to think about is, let me just go back to these designs, okay? When you're looking at a design, trying to figure out whether it's going to work for something like this, here's another design that pulled in. And let me just go through it and show you the way that this is made. All right. If I scroll back, you can see that the very first line is that outline. So anytime you have a design where they've got that already done, it just makes it so much easier because they've done half the work for you. All you have to do is cut that piece out. All right. And I want to just review this because I know this is a probably the most challenging thing for people is sometimes in the software, if you're not used to doing it. All right, I'm gonna to go to modify and I'm gonna drag back the design. Now I could also hide it over here, just hide the different colors. And then it's just gonna show me the one color. And look at that, the very first color, color number one is that outline. So all I'm gonna do is say, make a box select, or I could, if I wanted to just say, select all that's visible. And I'm going to touch copy. And now when I come back to the main homepage, I'm going to touch paste. And there I have that separate piece. So that was really, really easy to do. I'm going to change the color of it because I want to be able to know that that's not going to combine. So let's make it blue. All right. And then I can move it back into place and make sure it's good. And then I'm going to combine it. And then all I need to do is change that color so that it's going to move to the first color again. So I'm going to go to modify, select the color, and then move it up so it stitches first. And there we go. We have a magical applique border for our quilt designs. So you can see there's not just one. This is a design that I've chosen, but there's not just one way of doing this. There are thousands and thousands of embroidery designs that can work like this. And if you don't have embroidery, then using the piping can give you a very similar look. So uh, we have a couple of questions here. Um, Aquamagic stabilizer would work for quilt blocks. Yes, Aquamagic stabilizer would work for quilt blocks, except that sometimes we don't want to wash them because remember, we've got all that raw edge there. And when you're going to go and wash them to get rid of that Aquamagic, you're going to want to do that before you put it together with all the batting on all those different pieces. That's why I prefer tear away because then I can just tear away and I don't have to wash it. So for me, once we've got fabric and they're cut, like here, you can see all the threads that are coming off. If I had to wash this before I could use it and put it into the hoop, then it's just going to be more likely that the edges are going to get frayed and then that, um, that the shape of it's going to need to be reformed again. So the other reason that I don't use Aquamagic when I'm using quilt blocks, when I'm quilting quilt blocks is it's more expensive than a tearaway. So if I had an option of using something that worked extremely well and was less expensive, that's where my brain's going to go. Uh, but if you want to use Aquamagic and then wash it, then I then definitely go ahead and do it. But I would wash it before you put it together with all the batting and everything. Because once you've got the, the Aquamagic in the center of that hoop and you steam it, because you're using steam, 
the water will start to dissolve the aqua magic and then everything starts to shrink up and everything. So you want that out of there before you get your quilt put together. And so if you're going to use aqua magic, make sure after you've done the block that you wash it and get rid of the stabilizer. But every, you know, there's not a right or a wrong here. And that's what I love about what we do. There are hundreds of different ways of doing the same thing. And, you know, we, I, I mean, I'd like to see one time the different ways that everybody does the same type of thing, because there would be hundreds of different ideas about what the best stabilizer, what the best needle, what the best everything is. There is no right or wrong. And if it works for you, that's the most important thing. And I want everybody to know that, right? You know, I'm not, um, there's nothing about me that's special. I'm just here to share ideas. But the idea that I have a better way of doing it, a lot of times you guys might have ideas that I've never even thought about. So I, the best part of this is that we're here to share ideas and keep ourselves creating in fun ways. And uh, I've just got one more question. Let's see here. Uh, Glenda said, when creating a curve border, the ending needs to be lined up with the starting point for the next one. Yes, that's very true, right? So especially, that's why you want to think about when you're doing this, if you're using an endless hoop or whatever it is you're doing, after you stitch the first one, you're going to see where it stops, right? And then you're going to re-hoop and move it up. So not only did I use the basting when I did this, I also um, used the base function. So when I did the first one, I lined it up and I stitched out the first one. And I did the base so that I could make sure exactly where that base stitch was going to be. Then when I went to do the next one and I lined it up, I knew by that base function that it was exactly where I needed it to be. Now, there's one other trick that I have. I use when I'm doing this and I've got this in the hoop and I'm ready to rehoop. This last thing I want to tell you. Before I take it out of the hoop, it's going to be easier if you take a pencil that'll go away with water, I use a blue uh, blue wash away pen often, inside your hoop, wherever that is. So let's pretend this is the inside of the hoop edge, all right? The hoop's here. Draw a line everywhere here. And then as you go to extend it up, you will see the line that you've drawn in the next hooping. And then you're going to know that you've got it in there hooped exactly the same. And you don't have to worry about it taking it so long to keep hooping it and going. But thanks for the question, Glenda. And I hope you enjoyed the project because I know you did it and yours turned out great. So congratulations for giving it a try. And I hope some of these hints make it easier for everybody to kind of keep going. Remember, the most important thing is don't just float these extra fabrics one in front of the other. You've got to base them before you start so they don't move on you. That is absolutely the only way this is going to work out. And when you look at the jacket here, OK, look at how fun this could be. This could be the bottom of a skirt. It could be the bottom of a, you know, a jacket. It could be that you're going to make yourself a skirt and you want those two different colors together. Look at what an amazing um, look that you would get. It would look very complicated, but very, very easy to do. So before we everybody goes, I just want to give and I hope I've asked everybody's questions. And if there's something I've missed or didn't explain well, apparently I have trouble hanging things and getting 45 degrees done without, um, I should have, what I should have done would have been put that up ahead of time. And then I could taken it down to show you after it was all done. Um, there is a next Facebook live Wednesday, August 17th. And Wendy is going to do it. And Wendy is a new educator. I hope you tune in to see her because she's a lot of fun. Got a great sense of humor. And, um, then the next Sonet Facebook live is Wednesday, August 10th. And Mickey's doing that. And that's two o'clock central time, three o'clock Eastern time. So thank you all for joining. And I hope you give it a try and try something new. And if there's something I didn't explain well enough, I'll go back and, and try and add in some pictures or something else. So thanks for joining me. I really appreciate it. It's been wonderful.